Hey, Cancer Thrivers. Today, I wanted to talk to you about the nocebo effect. Kind of like the opposite of the placebo effect is the nocebo effect. And when I discovered the, the nocebo effect, I discovered a very important tool in my battle against cancer. So I'm going to share that with you today. We're going to go through it. I'm going to show you some examples and I'm going to show you how to apply the nocebo effect to your life so that you can defeat your diagnosis so that you can live your best life ever and be around for decades to come. If it's your first time on the channel, my name is Cancer Fighter Owen. You can just call me Owen. I was diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer and was sent home to get my affairs in order. That's when I discovered the metabolic pathway to health. And as I began to live a metabolic lifestyle, my cancer slowly deteriorated. And eventually after two years, I became totally cancer free. So now I've committed my life to making videos that help you cancer patients, caregivers, and really anybody going through, you know, serious disease um, in, in your life uh, to have hope that that your body is much more powerful than you think. Let's talk about the nocebo effect. Okay, the nocebo effect occurs when a person experiences negative symptoms or worsening health due to the expectation of harm rather than from any actual harmful substance or treatment. It means that human beings are likely to experience the symptoms, the side effects, and the pain that is suggested to them. And this occurs in the cancer diagnosis process all over the place. In other words, when a doctor says to you, you've got three months to live, then you're more likely to die because the nocebo effect says that your brain believes what this doctor told you and therefore your body starts to actually live out those beliefs in in thought word and deed meaning it becomes your worldview and there are examples of the nocebo effect all throughout the, the scientific literature. But I'm going to share with you two extreme examples that are very relevant to you and I as cancer patients, because this is, I believe, the biggest threat that we face in our in our cancer journey is the doctor tells us that we're going to die and they don't just say it once. My doctor told me every single visit over and over again like hey just a reminder even as my tumors were shrinking and i was showing up healthier and more vibrant i mean when i walked into her office i, I mean i was we could sh show pictures i was just like terrible i was in terrible shape i got better and healthier and she would she would put her hand on me and she would say i just want to remind you that you're gonna die you're not gonna live through this and I used to go home and laugh at it. And I would be like, she told me I was going to die again. And we'd laugh. And then we thought, you know, why are we going to a doctor who doesn't believe we're going to live? And what kind of a doctor prescribes very expensive medications and scans to a person who's going to die? I don't understand that philosophy at all. To me, it seems cruel. But let's, let's go into our examples because they fit in perfectly. The first is the Mr. Right example, who was diagnosed with advanced cancer and believed he was being treated with a miracle cure called uh, Krebozen. Now, his belief in this drug led to a temporary remission of his tumors. However, when it was revealed that Krebozen was ineffective, his tumors rapidly returned and he died shortly after, demonstrating how his belief in the treatment's efficacy directly impacted his health outcome. And we're putting a link to the study there so that you can, you can read that. So in this example, we see the nocebo effect actually bringing his cancer back. He believed in his mind that the treatment was ineffective and therefore the tumors came back. What's really interesting about this example, though, is that he believed the treatment was working and the tumors reduced. And I want to share with you a story. 
of my cancer journey, I, I went through sort of a two part cancer journey. One was the physical side and then was sort of like the neuro emotional side of cancer, right? Uh, and dealing with some of the childhood trauma and the self hatred and the, the abuse that I refused to believe I underwent as a child. I, I chose to not believe that that was really abuse. No, 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 no. Tons of people go through that. But it, it was as I, I was doing really good on the, the biological side and I was getting better and tumors were shrinking, but they weren't going away. And I got into neuroemotional and I worked with a therapist called Megan Van Zyl, who has an expertise in cancer patients. And as I began with six months of working with Megan, after six months, I received my first cancer-free test. It was a Grail test and, and I brag about this all the time. Today, I'm, I'm two years cancer-free. I asked Megan what she thought I said, Megan, what do you think led to my cancer free? I was like, how come I couldn't get it with a year and a half of all this nutritional stuff, right? But I achieved it on, on the emotional side. And she goes, you know, it's more about what you believe about your treatments that's gonna have a major impact on you. Now, if I had heard that on day one of my cancer journey, I would have laughed and I would have been like, what a kook. You know what I mean? I wasn't in a place where I was ready to hear that. But after all the mental torment and the mental self-control that you have to go through as a cancer patient, you got to wake up every single day and motivate yourself. And no one's going to do it for you. Everyone else is going to give you pity or they'll avoid you entirely because they don't know what to say to you. So the cancer journey is a very like, it's a lonely journey and yet it's like a busy journey because everyone will send you cards and drop off food from afar, but they don't, they don't want to get close and and do that thing. I wanna get you in this mindset of what you believe about your treatments and what you believe about your diagnosis is extremely important. Let's take a look at our next example. The next example is the example that, that woke me up, okay? This is the, the Mr. Lond example, and we're gonna read that. Everybody has heard the expression scared to death, but can the mind actually influence life and death or at least our well-being? Medical science is asking the same question, Consider the case of Sam Lond in 1974. Dr. Clifton Meter, a Nashville physician, treated him for cancer of the esophagus and considered him fatal back then. Now, Mr. Lond died a few weeks later, but an autopsy revealed that his esophagus was fine. So here we have a case of the nocebo effect in full force. A doctor told a patient that he would die. Now, when you dig into the details, the doctor gave him 90 days and Mr. Lawn passed away almost 90 days to the date of that diagnosis. So I encourage you to dig into these studies. But Mr. Lawn was given an improper diagnosis. He, he didn't have cancer of the esophagus. And yet, he was told it was fatal. He had fatal esophageal cancer, and he died 90 days later. Now, in the autopsy, it was revealed that he had some cancerous spots in his body, but not enough to kill him. And I think that's important because some of the trolls will go out there and they're gonna read that story and they're gonna go, no, 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 he had cancer in his body. Hey, look, pal, you got cancer in your body right now. It takes an awful lot of cancer to kill you. Certainly, not the kind of cancer that you found on accident, which is the case of Mr. Lont, right? It turns out he had cancer in different areas, but not enough to kill him. It was his belief in the diagnosis that killed him. And this is where it all comes together. Do you believe the diagnosis that your doctor gave you? That belief alone right there is enough to impact your outcome. That belief right there alone kind of tells me what your bullseye is. And, and as a, a cancer, I don't know, guide, um, you know, I walk alongside people with cancer and we have a support group. If you don't know, and there's, a, there's a link down below and you can check that out if you, you're a cancer patient or a caregiver. Uh, that's specifically who this group is catered to. So I walk through cancer with people and typically there's a certain age group, a little bit older than me, that will believe whatever the doctor says. Just whatever the doctor says is gospel to them. It's the truth to them. And that's because they're part of a generation 
that believes in the institutions, right? They're part of a generation that, that uh, you know, sees the medical industry as like American ingenuity and, and like the power of, of, uh, of, of American capitalism. And I think those things are good. You know, I, I think we live in a great country, but these are not trustworthy institutions and we have to challenge everything that we're being told. See, when, when I was told that I had a stage four terminal diagnosis, I believed it for three weeks. I believed it for three weeks and, and I cried over it. I shook my fist at the Lord. Like I, I, I did not handle it like Job. You know, if you don't know the story of Job, Job was like, hey, God's in control. He can give to me, he can take away, not me. I wouldn't like that. I was like, how could you do this to me, God? How could you do this to my kids? Because I believed the doctor's diagnosis. And then I want you to think about all the body chemicals and the stress hormones and, and the depression and the anger and the effect. Do you think that that helped shrink my tumors? It of course did not. Those stress hormones, they helped to grow the tumors. And, and we're kind of moving into the biology of belief, right? And if you, you're familiar with Dr. Bruce Lipton or um, Joe Dispenza, right? These are not people I align with on the, the spirituality side, but I align with them on the energetic, vibratory nature of all living things. And your thoughts affect how your body responds, right? I believe it was the goodness of God that gave us that kind of control over our bodies. It wasn't until I began to believe that I could get better. And I began to seek out treatments, modalities, and therapies that would accomplish that goal. I mean, that alone changed it versus some of the people that we have walked through cancer with. They tell us that they're just, they've just given up. I, one woman told me she was 62 years old. She said, I've been through enough in my life. This is God calling me home. And I'm telling you right now, God is not calling you home. That is not how he works. Yes, God gave you a, a, an obstacle to overcome, but that's now your mission. That's now your thing to overcome. And I want you to imagine just for a moment what it's going to be like to be a cancer survivor, to be the person in your neighborhood, in your church, in your bowling league that was diagnosed with a terrible disease and then did some non-traditional things and is now healthier and happier than they ever been. Imagine being that person. You, you'll become a person of influence in your family and in your neighborhood. You're gonna have some people that don't like it, for sure, but that's part of it. But I want you to think about that day when you're a cancer thriver. You're thriving after cancer. That's what you should be focused on. And so I believe the first journey in your battle, the first big milestone that you're going to have to overcome is the nocebo effect. You were told horrible and terrible things by your doctor that just aren't true. You're actually going to survive this and you're going to be healthier than ever. In the beginning for me, I did not believe I was going to beat my diagnosis. I, I believed I would die of cancer, but my goal was to live just healthy. If I only got two years to live, I want to be as healthy as I can. And then I got so healthy that I was like, maybe I could, maybe I could live a few more years. And then after a few months of that, I was like, I'll bet you I could beat my diagnosis. And I set a goal to be cancer free within one year. Now I didn't hit that goal. It took me two years, like two years and change, two years, two months. I mean, two months is when I got the test results, about two years. But I got cancer free in two years. And it all started with believing that I could beat cancer. So I made some videos on what I did, the treatments that I followed. They're not right for everybody. I mean, it's, everyone's got a kind of a different thing, but if you, if you zoom out and you look at what cancer patients did to beat cancer, you can see that there's nine things that everybody does. And I'm gonna cover those nine things in the next video and I'm gonna refer you to a book that will change your life. So go watch that video now. I'm Cancer Fighter Owen and I'll see you next time.